Hello, everyone, and welcome to kidney disease education class. I'm Christy Corbett. I'm a nephrology nurse practitioner, and I've been working in nephrology as a nurse for the last 19 years. I've taught kidney disease education uh, classes for many years as well. I hope that you'll enjoy this introduction to kidney disease, discussing the pathophysiology of kidney disease, how the kidneys work, and how we how we uh, determine your stage of kidney disease and ways to slow down the progression of the disease. Where are my kidneys? So typically we're born with two kidneys. Um, if you have been told otherwise, it's probably because you've had a sonogram. Your kidneys are the size of your individual fist and they are located mid back where the rib cage protects the top part of your kidney. The kidneys filter and remove waste out of the body. They also help remove salt, which in turn removes extra water out of your body. In addition to that, those main components of kidneys, they also help make hormones that control your blood pressure. They help absorb vitamin D. They help regulate electrolytes like sodium and potassium. They help with acid and base balance in your body. And they also help keep your bones healthy. The parts of the kidney include essentially the most important part, which is called the glomeruli. The glomeruli holds millions of tiny nephrons, which are the filtering components of the kidneys. And those nephrons are what filters the waste out of the body. And then in turn, inside the kidney tubules, the waste is turned into urine. There's a vein that supplies the clean blood back to your body and the artery that comes from the rest of your bloodstream to the kidney where the waste is then cleaned. That component is um, the artery that supplies the blood to your kidney actually comes from every time your heart beats, 20% of the blood flow from the cardiac output goes directly through that artery into the kidney. So if you have kidney damage from heart disease, that's often why, because the kidneys are compromised from getting lack of blood flow. So here's a picture of those nephrons I just mentioned um, that are housed in the glomerulus. The tubule is where the urine is produced, and then the clean blood is returned back through your blood vessels. If you've ever heard the term creatinine, that's a measure of blood waste produced by your muscles. Everybody's muscles produce it and the kidney's job is to excrete it. So when we do a blood test, if that level is elevated, that tells us your kidneys are not doing a good job in getting rid of that, that muscle waste. If the kidneys don't work as they should, again, we can do a blood test and look at your creatinine level. Sometimes we take that creatinine level and we do a calculation called the glomerular filtration rate. So those glomeruli are the ones that house the millions of nephrons that clean your blood. If that glomerular filtration rate is normal, it would be above 90 and it would tell us that your kidneys are functioning normally, essentially. Less than 60 over a three month span of time tells us that you do have a component of chronic kidney disease. We also check for urine um, protein. So we look for an albumin creatinine ratio or a protein creatinine ratio. And if those are elevated, it tells us there's some damage to the glomeruli as well from various reasons. And we'll talk about those in a minute. Chronic kidney disease may or may not progress to kidney failure. And we'll talk about some ways to minimize that progression in a little bit. Symptoms of kidney disease. Most of the time patients don't have very many symptoms of chronic kidney disease until the disease is really advanced. Um, you may have some symptoms that pertain to anemia or bone health. Some have dry itchy skin related to elevated phosphorus levels. Some patients are confused related to elevated toxins in the bloodstream. Sometimes the diabetes and blood pressure get harder to control when kidney disease advances. And some people just feel almost flu-like with nausea or vomiting or decreased appetite, low energy. So those are all some symptoms that your providers need to be aware of every time you visit with your nephrology provider um, or your primary care provider so that we can check your labs and see where your kidney function's at. 
We mentioned already um, the urine test for protein. That would be an early indicator of kidney disease. So oftentimes patients with diabetes have their urine protein checked at least once a year. And that often prompts the primary care provider to refer to a nephrology specialist um, if those numbers are abnormal. Um, we look at blood tests. That includes that creatinine I mentioned, which is the measure of blood waste. That also includes a BUN. We check your electrolytes. Um, an ultrasound might be needed to assess your kidney size and shape and make sure there's no masses or stones or uh, cysts on your kidneys. And sometimes if you're spilling a lot of protein in, or blood in your urine, a kidney biopsy is often indicated to determine exactly what's going on um, in your kidney tissue to give us a true diagnosis so that we can treat you appropriately. So how would your doctor or nurse practitioner decide if you have kidney disease? So we look at that GFR or glomerular filtration rate. If that number is not normal, then we will presume that you have some sort of kidney damage. It's either acute or chronic, and we'll talk about that in a moment also. But your GFR is based upon that creatinine level I mentioned, your age, your race, and your sex. The reason that we look at those specific numbers is because if you have more muscle mass, your creatinine level may be higher and therefore your GFR might be higher as well because that creatinine is based upon muscle mass. Um, sometimes we also look at your albumin. If you're spilling a lot of protein in your urine, we wouldn't be surprised to see a low albumin level. We look at your weight and make sure that those are stable. And the BUN is another measure of waste that we look at as well. We can stage chronic kidney disease. The staging system came from years of research to help us help you in knowing where you are at in your disease progression and what specific labs that we need to order each time you come to see us, as well as how frequently um, we have the visits for your appointments, um, and then how to prepare you for renal replacement therapy or other treatment options if that's needed. So stage one, is essentially a normal GFR with your percent kidney function over 90, but we've seen some damage to the kidneys in protein in the urine, or we may have seen some damage with an abnormal ultrasound. Um, so we'll watch you probably once a year, typically at stage one. It depends on your provider again. Stage two is some mild damage. That's when your percent kidney function or GFR is between 60 to 89. Um, that we will probably watch you at least once or twice a year, again, depending on your provider. Stage three is moderate damage to the kidneys. This is our most common stage of kidney disease right now. We have a percent kidney function of 30 to 59, and then we will monitor you probably more closely about every four to six months. And we'll draw labs each time that we see you so that we can adjust medications and diet according to what we're, we're looking at in your lab values. Stage four is progression to severe kidney damage, and that is when your GFR percent kidney function estimation is between 15 and 29. During this stage, we might see you a little more frequently, but we're also going to get you prepared for either a kidney transplant or dialysis or conservative management, but we'll certainly give you a lot of education during this time period so that you're well aware of your options. Stage five is really considered kidney failure or end-stage renal disease. That is when your percent kidney function is less than 15 or your GFR is less than 15. It's at this time that we hope that we have an access in place if you're going to choose dialysis or you have met with the kidney transplant team so that we can get you prepared for your kidney transplant. Um, Lowering the amount of protein that you spill in your urine can surely slow the process of and progression of kidney disease. And we'll talk in a little bit about some methods that we can do to slow down that protein in the urine. So who's at risk for kidney disease? You might be surprised to hear that as of a year or so ago, there were over 30 million Americans with chronic kidney disease at some stage. Um, the persons at risk are um, racial or ethnic minorities, people who've had an acute kidney injury, meaning you've had some damage, you were in the hospital, you were sick, your kidneys took a hit. Um, they may have recovered from that, but that still kind of predisposes you to having some kidney disease at some point. 
Um, older age, we don't really have great research on what kidney function should look like in somebody who's over 60 years old. Most of our research is done in the 30 to 60 year range in, in some peds, pediatric population. So as we age, we know that kidney function actually will decline normally. Um, just like sometimes we need more eyeglasses, um, sometimes our hearing goes, we know our muscle mass isn't as great as it used to be when we age. So normal kidney decline as papal um, age is acceptable. We just don't want um, kidney failure, of course. Um, poverty certainly affects people with um, kidney disease as well. Um, just because of diet uh, changes, a lot of people have to eat processed foods which are high in salt, which can cause more problems. Um, some chemicals and drugs, including tobacco, um, cocaine is certainly um, a places people at risk for having kidney disease, acute kidney injury, um, smoking cigarettes places people at risk as well. Um, it kind of damages the kidneys. Uh, Over-the-counter medications like Aleve, Advil, ibuprofen, Motrin, and some prescription anti-inflammatory medications can also damage the, ki damage the kidneys. They decrease the blood flow to the kidneys. They make blood pressure worsen. Um, and so that in turn causes some kidney damage. Sometimes that's reversible and sometimes Sometimes it's permanent. It just depends on the patient and the amount of medication they've taken over the years. So what are the types of kidney failure? I kind of just mentioned the acute kidney injury, and that is something that happens to you if you're sick. You may have been in the hospital. Um, we see that often with people who have sepsis or full body infections or with the flu, um, people with stomach problems or what we commonly call the stomach flu. Um, de dehydration can decrease that that pump from the heart to the kidneys and can therefore cause um, decreased blood flow to the kidneys and cause some kidney damage. So most of the time, that short term, sometimes it can last up to six months depending on the diagnosis, um, but oftentimes it may or may not become um, chronic kidney disease at some point, but it does definitely predispose you to having kidney disease at some point in your lifetime. Chronic kidney disease, on the other hand, or chronic kidney failure is um, an abnormality of your kidney lab values or your kidney's inability to filter the waste or remove the fluids um, on a long-term basis. So this is a diagnosis made of at least three months of abnormal labs. So we know that your chronic kidney disease is most likely not going to reverse or get better, but yet we want to slow down the progression of that disease. So Kidney disease is really common in the United States. I mentioned the number of patients who have chronic kidney disease across America is over 30 million. Um, we've had, according to the United States Renal Data Systems, 2016 annual data report. This guides nephrologists and nephrology providers in what kind of patient population we have out there who's on dialysis or kidney transplanted. So, about 118,000 new patients started dialysis or had a kidney transplant. 477,000 or so were on dialysis. 200,000 had a kidney transplant. In Missouri, 8,500 were on dialysis and 4,100 or so had a kidney transplant. The leading causes of kidney disease, uh, I already mentioned if you had diabetes, your primary care specialist should be checking your urine at least once a year. So diabetes is definitely the leading cause of kidney disease in our country. Um, we see a lot of patients with diabetic kidney disease. We often find that patients with diabetes have um, early onset of protein in the urine. So often they're referred to nephrology pretty early because of that nephrology being the kidney specialist. Um, so we want to monitor that and we want to make sure that the diabetes is well controlled. And that's one of those ways to slow the progression of the kidney disease is good control of your diabetes. The second leading cause of kidney disease is high blood pressure. And often your primary care physician will provide a referral to nephrology to manage high blood pressure as well as kidney disease. Other, opt or other uh, causes of kidney failure include um, what we call renal artery stenosis, and we would know that by doing a scan of your kidneys um, or a Doppler to determine if the um, kidney arteries are narrowed down, meaning that when that 
blood comes from the heart to the kidneys. Sometimes if it's narrow, then you'll end up with high blood pressure and some kidney problems related to that. Um, inflammation includes that um, infection or inflammation of the filtering component of the kidneys, the glomerulus. So if that becomes inflamed, this is often diagnosed by biopsy, then we can often um, suppress that inflammation by putting you on um, prednisone or some other anti-inflammatory medications that are not harmful to the kidneys. If we see that your kidney disease is because of a kidney stone, a tumor or a prostate issue, there's often medications that we can use. We work closely with urologists who treat the bladder and prostate um, to help remove that obstruction so that your urine can drain appropriately. Some genetic causes of kidney disease are polycystic kidney disease or Alport syndrome. Um, FSGS is focal segmental glomerulosclerosis um, that is diagnosed by biopsy also. If you have Frequent urinary tract infections or kidney infections that can cause some permanent damage to the kidneys as well. So if you notice that you're having those symptoms, um, urinary frequency or urgency or burning when you urinate often, then definitely get that treated as soon as you can. And then there's autoimmune diseases, um, HIV and AIDS. Um, in my patient population, I've managed several patients with HIV-related kidney disease. And unfortunately, some of the medications used to treat HIV and AIDS can also cause some kidney problems. So we have to watch those patients really closely um, so that their kidney function maintains and doesn't get worse. And another uh, diagnosed uh, autoimmune disease is called lupus. Um, most of those patients have some joint pains. They may have some chest pains. Um, sometimes they have a, a rash on their face. Sometimes they're spilling protein in the urine, and that's diagnosed by a biopsy as well. Other causes of kidney disease. I mentioned anti-inflammatory and over-the-counter medications, toxic chemicals. Some people are born with uh, defective um, kidneys, um, the acute kidney injury. Um, if you're not draining your bladder appropriately, uh, that urine can reflex back into the kidneys and cause some damage. And then uh, we try to minimize the amount of contrast dye our patients receive if they need a CT scan. Um, if they can do the scan and get the result they're looking for without using contrast, we highly recommend that. Um, there are other measures that we can take by hydrating our patients and adjusting some of the medications to protect the kidneys if that's absolutely necessary. If you have any symptoms, tell your providers your symptoms. Those can be early indication of worsening kidney disease um, and things that we need to manage appropriately with meds or with a diet. Um, I can't stress enough about slowing down the progression of kidney disease. I know that nobody wants to be on dialysis. Nobody wants to have, a, have to have a kidney transplant. So these are things that everybody can do at this stage, whatever stage you're at, to help slow down the disease to avoid kidney failure. We want to also make sure that you're minimizing your salt intake. Um, I say in my kidney disease classes all the time that most Americans eat probably two or three times more salt than we really should. And that's our kind of our society um, has done that to us with fast foods and processed foods that we're grabbing on the go all the time. Um, if you're on a fluid restriction, make sure that you're following that. Apparently your kidneys or your heart can't handle that extra fluid. Sometimes we want our patients to drink more. So it all depends on your individual um, kidney disease and what's caused it. Um, so definitely talk with your providers if you're not sure where you're supposed to be on your fluid intake. If you have diabetes, please be aware that your A1C level should be around 7. And your A1C is your three-month average blood sugar. So around 7 for most patients is appropriate. Um, that can slow down the progression of kidney disease. We also want your blood pressure and your cholesterol controlled. Um, that can also slow down uh, kidney disease, but also slows down heart disease related to kidney disease, which is actually the number one cause of death for kidney patients is heart disease. So we want to slow that down also. Um, if you have sleep problems, if you snore loudly at night, if you wake yourself up at night, it's a very good idea to get tested for sleep apnea. If you have sleep apnea and that keeps you up at night with your breathing, it also decreases the amount of oxygen that your organs are getting. So a CPAP 
or a BiPAP machine or appropriate treatment for sleep apnea can actually supply your organs, including your kidneys, with more oxygen to help keep you um, uh, keep your organs healthy. If you feel as if you're having trouble emptying your bladder, if you're male or female, definitely talk to your provider about that too. Emptying your bladder or at least um, urinating several times a day is very important to make sure that your body's getting rid of those wastes and it's not backing up and causing more kidney damage. If you have trouble urinating, definitely talk to your provider. There may be a prostate issue if you're a man and we can address that with medications as well. Um, exercise is good for everyone. The American Heart Association recommends at least 30 minutes of exercise per day, three to four days per week. It doesn't mean that 30 minutes needs to be consecutive. It, you can split that up. You can park a little farther at the grocery store, take your 10 minute walk inside, take your 10 minute walk back outside. You've got 20 minutes already done there. So then you only have 10 more minutes um, throughout the rest of the day to get that time in. Uh, Fitbits are very popular as well to keep you on track, keep you up and moving. Um, not everybody can afford or buy a Fitbit, but just a recommendation there. If you're a smoker, um, stopping smoking can certainly slow down the progression of kidney disease as well. Um, also puts a little bit extra cash in your pocket so you don't have to buy those cigarettes, but we can certainly assist um, in smoking counseling. So if you're ready, um, mentally ready, definitely talk to your providers about that as well. So kidney disease comes from high blood pressure, but kidney disease can also cause high blood pressure. Um, it's kind of the chicken or the egg which came first, but certainly it can worsen if you have kidney disease. And as kidney disease progresses, progresses I've often seen patients um, need more uh, antihypertensive medicines or blood pressure medication to control their blood pressures. So sometimes you may have two or three medications to start with. Um, as the kidney disease advances, you may need three or four or five medications, okay? Heart disease um, can happen from kidney disease. It's also a cause of kidney disease. As I mentioned, your heart pumps the 20% of the blood flow to the um, kidneys. Um, so we want to make sure that we keep your heart healthy. That is, a, a, as I said, the leading cause of kidney-related uh, death is heart disease, not necessarily kidney failure. Um, and we can slow down the progression of heart disease with certain medications, especially if you're diabetic, um, talk to your provider about making sure you're on a statin medicine, a baby aspirin, um, uh, medicines called lisinopril. If you have low red blood cell count um, because your kidneys are not able to produce the appropriate hormones to build up your red blood cells, that can lead to anemia. Um, anemia can also be related to a low iron, which the kidneys also help absorb. So we can treat those if we notice them um, with either IV iron or IV or medication to take by mouth um, for uh, low iron stores. We can also treat low red blood cells once the iron's replete with an injectable medication. And that's something you would want to talk to your doctor about before um, starting any new medicines as well. Um, we want to make sure that your nutritional status is good. We want to make sure that food tastes good to you. If it doesn't, please let us know. We want to make sure that you have um, a stable weight. If you start losing weight unintentionally, you need to let us know that also so that we can manage that. Um, bone disease is a very important uh, complication of kidney disease. What happens with bone disease um, is that your kidneys are not able to excrete the phosphorus out of the body as they should. And so that can actually lead to brittle bone disease. And we'll talk about that here shortly. Your kidneys and heart are connected. Um, I already mentioned the, the pump being supplying 20% of the blood flow to the kidneys, but kidney disease can also raise blood pressure and worsen heart disease. So we wanna really watch your blood pressures closely and address that and put you on more medication sometimes if needed. A low salt diet can also help with that. Um, but if you have heart or kidney disease, definitely make sure you're following up with your kidney specialist, your primary care doctor, or your heart doctor, okay? Um, so if you think of calcium and phosphorus on a scale, um, if your kidneys are not able to remove the phosphorus out of the body, the phosphorus levels in your bloodstream go up, which in turn on that scale causes your calcium to actually go down. There's a gl gland, four glands actually, in your neck that help produce a hormone 
they think they're doing a good job in pulling this calcium out of the bones into the bloodstream to help regulate the calcium and phosphorus balance. This is called your parathyroid gland, and it produces parathyroid hormone. If you can think about the repercussions of what would happen if your calcium is being pulled from your bones, it causes your bones to be very weak and brittle. Some patients can have bone fractures um, and overall just poor bone health. So we monitor these levels very closely to make sure that we keep your bones as healthy as possible. And we can add certain vitamin D medications, a low phosphorus diet, um, which would include nuts and beans and dairy products, dark colas. Um, we can remove those. Uh, I think your dietitian will talk about those in more detail later. If you need a referral for dietary, that's certainly some options that we can give for you. Um, if you need assistance in your diabetes management, we would love to refer you to diabetes education as well. Again, these are things that are important to slow down and minimize the progression of kidney disease. So we're happy to assist in any way we can with these referrals. I mentioned an ACE inhibitor. Those are medications that end in Pril. Um, lisinopril has been around for many years. Um, An ARB ends in Artin. Um, some of those medicines have been around for years to help protect the kidney and slow down the progression of kidney disease. Most of the time, as long as there's no other reason or an allergy um, to these medications, they have um, been known to minimize progression of kidney disease, help keep your heart and your kidneys healthy. Um, we also want to make sure that you're staying away from anti-inflammatories, um, and they're also called NSAIDs. That includes Celebrex, um, Motrin, Advil, Aleve, Ibuprofen. Um, if you have a question about one of those medicines or if you have a question about an herb that you found might be helpful, please bring those bottles with you or take a picture of it and bring it with you when you see your provider so that we can direct you appropriately whether or not um, those medicines would be safe for your kidneys for you to take. If you have kidney disease, you can most likely be expected to take several new medicines. Um, we often try dietary adjustments first because sometimes that's easier for our patients to minimize phosphorus intake, to minimize salt intake, to help with blood pressure or uh, fluid that you might have on board. Um, I recommend a kidney-friendly vitamin for most of our patients so that we can um, um, keep your B12 and your iron and everything regulated appropriately. Um, if you have too much phosphorus in your bloodstream, we can add a binder which binds to the phosphorus that you're eating and um, it excretes it through your, your stomach and your stool instead of the kidneys trying to remove it. Um, iron is important. Some medication tips. It's always a good idea to carry not only your medication list with all of the doses on it, but sometimes just throw your medicine bottles in a bag and bring them with you to your appointment if you can. Um, those are um, a way for us to keep track of exactly what's prescribed for you and exactly what you're taking. Um, there have been often times providers make medication changes and the patient still gets the refills from the pharmacy and so then they end up being on the same medicine, um, two different names of the same class of medications, which is not healthy either. So if you're not sure um, exactly how to write it out as far as your milligrams times per day, just throw them all in a bag and we're happy to take a look at them when you come in to see us. Um, take your medications as prescribed. That's very important also. Um, we want to make sure that you're getting everything in that we've um, recommended for you. If you can't afford to take your medications or pick up your medications, please let your doctor, your nurse practitioner, your social worker, your pharmacist know. Um, there's lots of options out there for assistance for medications. And if you can, try to stick with the same pharmacist, um, the same pharmacy program, so that when your various providers are sending medications in, your pharmacist also has an eye on what's, what you're taking and how often to. Tips at the pharmacy. <clears throat> Again, try to stick with the same pharmacist, but you can also um, 
ask your pharmacy as a resource on how to take those medications. If you feel like you're taking too many in the morning or too many in the evening, or you're uncertain as to what the prescription tells you to do, please ask your pharmacist. Again, they're a great resource. And if they're not sure exactly what your provider wants you to do, then they will reach out to us. I've had pharmacists call me often about questions um, on medications. If you um, want to, you're welcome to read the drug labels and information on the packets. Just be aware that a lot of those have side effects and those might then deter you from wanting to take those medications, but um, it's a good idea to read over them, especially with over-the-counter medications and herbs and ask if you have questions. So some other tips for you and your family. Ask questions. You can't ask enough questions. Um, you can't have enough knowledge about this disease process. Um, so attend as many classes, review as much as you can from reputable sources. Um, the Missouri Kidney Program, the National Kidney Foundation, um, and some other sites are great resources for you. So make sure that you're using reputable sources. Don't just Google kidney disease on the internet and hope to get um, a good peer-reviewed um, information. If you need to, to keep track of your appointments and all of that, a medical journal or a medicine journal is a very good idea. You can list all of your medicines in there, bring them with you. Like I mentioned, um, your appointment times, especially when you get to the transplant stage, they will keep you very busy on um, getting that workup done for a kidney transplant. So it's a good idea to have a notebook or even an app. There's lots of apps out there for kidney patients that can assist you in your, your journey. Um, if you're uncertain about what your provider is talking to you about, please ask. Um, my mom knows what I do for a living and she's very excited to call me after her doctor's appointments and tell me everything that happened and everything she had no idea what they were telling her. So um, it's a good idea to ask questions while you're there. Of course, you have resources outside, um, family and friends, but if you can ask the questions while you're there, it can give some peace of mind to you as well. So please ask, we're happy to answer those questions. Um, if you're not sure of your lab results, feel free to ask those also. Um, you can get a copy every time that you come in. Um, there's resources out there that list the type of labs that we're checking for your kidney disease, the normal values, what your values are, we can plug those in. Um, and that's a great resource. So you can kind of track and trend your, your lab values just like we do. So we'll talk later today about, or later on in the session about, some treatment options for kidney failure. Um, I mentioned dialysis, I mentioned kidney transplant, I've mentioned conservative management. So that is where this, if you choose not to choose or to treat kidney failure, um, conservative management can be another method for you. That would be continuing to come in to your clinic, see your nephrologist or nephrology nurse practitioner without dialysis therapy. Of course, we know that death will be imminent. Um, it kind of just depends on the quality of life that you want with or without dialysis. But you might wanna talk with your family. Um, this is the point where I would talk with my patient about doing an advanced care plan. Advanced care planning talks about your goals as a patient, what you want. You can discuss it with your family. It can also talk about if you want aggressive measures for your treatment, if you want, um, if you can't breathe, do you want to be intubated? If your kidneys stop working, do you want dialysis? Do you want CPR? You can be as detailed or as broad as possible as you want. Um, and you can change that at any time also. If you're not sure whether you want to do dialysis for kidney failure, you can do a trial dialysis for a month or so. Um, you can go to a dialysis unit and tour it and discuss with other patients on how their um, quality of life is with their dialysis treatment. Um, you can help your family by making some end of life planning. Um, if you feel like you're really strongly not wanting dialysis, then talk to your providers about potentially getting palliative care involved. Palliative care can help support you um, your symptoms, help support your family. Um, they also discuss goals of care um, in, an, in an advanced care plan and help make sure that there's somebody available to make decisions for you if you need them. 
Um, <clears throat> I often tell my patients who choose not to do dialysis that they can essentially eat whatever they want to. Um, if they eat, however, if they eat a lot of potassium, that might cause a cardiac arrhythmia where your heartbeat would beat faster and abnormally, um, which may actually um, kind of speed up your death. But if you don't want to follow a specific kidney diet, you don't have to if you're on palliative care or if you're on conservative management. And I always tell my patients that you can change your mind at any time. If you decide that you don't want to do dialysis and we've done conservative management for six months and now you're starting to feel a little sick um, or you're having some symptoms of kidney failure that we mentioned earlier, the nausea, the vomiting, swelling, um, you're not feeling well, we can certainly um, get you in the hospital and we put a dialysis catheter in your chest and we can often dialyze you that same day to remove those toxins and get you feeling a little bit better. So you're always welcome to change your mind. The rest of the options for kidney failure, if you decide not to do the conservative management, is kidney transplant. Kidney transplants can come from somebody who's living or from a deceased donor, also called a cadaver transplant. Um, if you know of somebody who's willing and able to give you a kidney, I highly suggest you take that person or persons with you when you meet with the transplant team on the first visit and they can work them through the process also. Peritoneal dialysis can be done um, at home. Um, you can travel very easily with peritoneal dialysis. It requires a surgical catheter placement into your abdomen, and you would do the dialysis at home without any blood exchange and without having to go to the clinic three days a week for, for dialysis. Um, you can do this manually, also called CAPD, or you can do it with the cycler at nighttime, which is called CCPD. And um, later on in this educational session, you'll be instructed on um, more in-depth review of all of these. Hemodialysis is a uh, filtering of your blood. You must have an access to do hemodialysis. Fistula is your best option, which is a surgical connection of your artery and your vein underneath the skin. Um, a graft is our next best, which is an artificial vein, and then a dialysis catheter often placed in the chest is our last resort if needed for dialysis. Hemodialysis is often done in an in-center dialysis unit three days a week, usually about four, time, four hours each, each time. And then um, you can also be trained to do hemodialysis at home. They would get you a machine and you would need a caregiver there with you at all times, but that caregiver can also be trained to do the dialysis at home. So who is your healthcare team? Obviously, you are the most important person in your healthcare team. And it is our job as nephrology providers to uh, grant your wishes on your treatment options. Um, your dietitian, uh, your social worker are very important, especially to minimize the progression of kidney disease with diet changes. Your nephrologist, also known as your kidney doctor, kidney specialist, or nephrology nurse practitioner. Your surgeon. Um, that could be your transplant surgeon or your vascular surgeon or your general surgeon, depending on which treatment option you choose. Um, your nurse is very important also um, to help guide you. They know you very well. They check you into all of your clinic appointments. They review your labs as well. So um, your dentist is important. Um, dental health is very important to help minimize heart complications, actually, um, but also keeping your teeth help healthy helps minimize any acute kidney injury or other problems that can happen with your um, kidneys and also prepares you for a kidney transplant because they really want your kidneys to or your teeth to be very clean and in great shape prior to a kidney transplant. Um, pharmacists we mentioned are great resources for medication questions. Um, if you're on dialysis, your dialysis technician will get to know you very well in center. Um, of course, your family and your friends and any um, spiritual support or um, organizational support that you have is very important. Patient rights. You want to be treated, your right is to be treated with dig dignity and respect. You want to be informed and that is our right to inform you of your treatment options. That is our right to inform you of your prognosis, inform you of your lab results and any changes that we make with your health. Um, you have a right to privacy and confidentiality. And here's this information about the advanced care planning or advanced directive. Um, 
you have a right to know about those. Um, you can find them at any library. This is what's going to guide what you do and what you don't want done in your healthcare. Um, you have the right to be told about any services, charges, expectations. Um, if you have a complaint, you have a right to file that complaint also without repercussions. Responsibilities. So we ask that you be on time for your appointments, that you bring your medications with you, that you follow your diet and medication orders. Um, we mention those diet and medication changes based upon years and years of research that's done for kidney patients. Um, we don't just pick a medication um, at will. Um, we look at what stage of kidney disease you're at. We look at your electrolytes, like your potassium and your sodium. We look at your fluid status. We look at your bone health. We look at all of those things those kidneys help regulate. And if we af offer a diet change or a medication to help support you and what your kidneys are not able to do, then we hope that you'll help, help us and follow those suggestions. You also have the responsibility to be as involved in your care as you want to be. Um, and that's completely up to you. Um, try to work if you can. Um, kidney failure does not mean that you can't work. I've had many patients that have adjusted their shifts on dialysis so that they can hold a job. It kind of depends on how you feel and um, depends on your work schedule, but often we can, we can write notes to your employer to let them know that you're on dialysis if you need to. Um, if you have a change in insurance, please let us know. If you have a change in contact information, please let us know. It's very frustrating as providers to try to call a patient with a medicine change or a critical lab value and not be able to get a hold of them. So it keeps me up at night if that happens. Um, and also try to maintain your fitness as much as you can. The more active you are, the better off quality of life that you're going to have. Um, helps treat depression. It helps keep your heart healthy. Um, your heart is a muscle also, so we want to keep it healthy. And again, you're in charge of your health care. Your quality of life depends on you. And we're here to guide you in that process. So we're here to educate you, give you your treatment options, and then support you in those uh, choices that you make. And you can do this. Thank you.